I have now, after all of these years building businesses, this is just what I was meant to do and why I am here to be able to help women be able to have the resources and community to grow their business. Welcome to the B2B Breakthrough Podcast. We're here to bring you all the best knowledge, insights, and strategies from e-commerce experts, successful business owners, and the team at Alibaba.com that you'll need to grow your business and achieve your next big breakthrough. I'm your host, Sharon Guy. Tell us more about how you got started. I think a lot of people even dream about having one business in their lifetime, and yet you have four. So I'm sure it wasn't all a one launch of the four. It came gradually. So tell us more about your story. Yeah, my company is called Entreprenista. We're a media company and membership community for our women founders and leaders. So we're partnering with Alibaba now to share all of their resources with our whole community. I feel like it actually all goes back to my childhood, though. So I have four businesses now, but my first business was actually, like many people, selling Girl Scout cookies as a child. And I still remember that taste of entrepreneurship when I first started and just being a top seller and finding things that people needed and things that were trending and making a business out of it. So many years later, after, of course, starting my actual first business, Social Fly, which I'll share more about, that's when I actually realized I'm like so much of entrepreneurship really stemmed back to my childhood and those early experiences. But my first business, uh, Social Fly, which is a full service social media marketing and influencer agency, my business partner and I started that business now 11 plus years ago. It actually started as a side hustle on the side of our full-time jobs. We started taking on a few clients on the side and quickly realized after doing that for about 10 months that it was not an after-work activity, could be an actual business. So we decided to quit our corporate jobs on the same day and really never looked back and scaled our agency organically. We were quickly number one on Google for social media agency and influencer agency and winning awards for our work. So because of that, so many women started coming to us, asking us for advice and help and wanting to pick our brain. And Courtney and I are the type of people that like to help absolutely everyone. But we realized we physically couldn't go out to coffee with everyone and still run our core business. And that's actually how Entrepreneurista was born, which actually started as our podcast. And now over the years has evolved into a full media company and a membership community, which is called the Entrepreneurista League for founders who are looking for that connection and support. So really with all of our businesses, like one thing has led to the next. They did not all start at the same time. And then just folded in very neatly into one after another. So when you started this community, did you start with your listeners first then? What were the first group of people like? Because I imagine when you're starting out a community, the first couple of members are pretty pivotal in terms of shaping the tone and the next group of people that they then spread the word to and emanates from that. So what had happened was during the pandemic, you probably know a lot of people who experienced either losing their job during the pandemic and wanted to start a business. Those women were reaching out to us because they started listening to the podcast and wanted help. We started also getting messages from a lot of founders who needed help pivoting their business at the time. And Courtney and I had started our podcast really as this platform to share lots of stories of women that were growing and scaling businesses. But we were getting so many messages from our listeners during the pandemic. And that's when Courtney and I realized we have to start this community and create a community with what women need at all stages of their business, whether they're just launching or they're scaling and they need help along the way and have essentially all of the resources that Courtney and I wished we had when we started our first business, Social Fly. So the first thing we did was we built out what we wanted to have in a community when we were first starting our business. And we spent about six months putting all of those pieces together. And then when we went to actually launch the Entreprenista League, we first shared, of course, with our listeners on our podcast that we were going to be launching the community and on our social because we were hearing from everyone that they were looking for that. We would be looking for our first founding members to join. And really, those first members were just so enthusiastic because they wanted the help. They wanted the resource. Versus no one was meeting up in person yet. It was still in 2021 and there were not these big in-person events to be able to connect and come together. So everyone was so willing to help each other, to learn, to connect. And that really, like you said, Sharon, set the tone for what our community is because it's all about collaboration over competition and everyone really just fostering this relationship of we can all win together if we can help each other. Were these people founders or entrepreneurs already or were they thinking about stepping into that? Or was it also a side hustle sort of thing like how you guys had started? 
It was really a combination of all of it. So actually, one of our founding members, Mara Smith, she has a company. It's called Inspiro Tequila. And Mara had actually reached out to me during the pandemic. She was planning to launch her new tequila brand, and she was looking for referrals, resources. So the day that we said we're open for membership, she was like our first member to join and was just ready to get in there and get access to all the resources. Then we had lots of members join that are seasoned entrepreneurs, and they wanted to be in the community to connect and give back. One of our members, Gwen Whiting, she is the founder of a company called called The Laundress that sold to Unilever about four years ago. And she's in our community as well. So it really is this great mix of some founders, we call them now entrepreneurious, so another team said, people who are thinking about starting a business and want to be entrepreneurs, and they're looking for those resources and looking to learn from others. Entrepreneurious. Yes, we might have made that up. So when on our team started saying that, and I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. I like that. And we love helping people really think through, what could your business be? What resources do you need? Oh, who can we connect you to who's already done it that you can learn from? And we're making all of these intros for our members in the community, which is just so nice to see. Actually, one of our members, Adriana Kerrig, she's the founder of our company called Little Words Project. She just hosted office hours for our community last week. And she was sharing with everyone how in the early days, she was using Alibaba when she first started her business to really get her business off the ground. And I didn't even know that she was on Alibaba. So it was so exciting to hear her share that. But lots of our members who have product-based businesses do go to Alibaba to source products and figure out what do they want to build. And then I see a lot of our members in the community that are also using Alibaba. They're all like connecting together and learning from each other, which is just awesome. That's super cool. I had heard of the laundress before. And then the tequila, I think it's so clever to launch that during the pandemic. I think alcohol sales just soared through the roof. Is it mainly in the CPG world where everyone has a physical product or what are some of the other businesses that other people have? We have an incredible mix in the community. So about 50% of our members are product-based businesses, but the other half are service-based businesses, which is really great to see because there's members in our community that own marketing agencies, bookkeeping companies, accountants, lawyers, all of the things that every business owner actually needs. So then everyone's able to collaborate, to work with each other. I see lots of our service-based business owners setting up referral agreements together and making these referral pods so they can refer clients to each other, which is just awesome because when everyone's able to come together and focus on really building each other's businesses together and seeing like, where can we help each other? All this magic just starts to happen. There's also nonprofit business owners in the community app. It's really a very wide mix in terms of industry, ages of our members, locations, and then everyone's able to help each other. Do you provide some sort of structure for them? Like after they enter the community, is there a step one or step two to five where you are curating maybe that initial group of people that they meet? Or is it a party where you enter and float to whoever you want to talk to? It's a combination of both. It's definitely a party when you enter because we have an introduce yourself room in the community platform. So once you get in, everyone's making an introduction post and everyone's welcoming. If they share like, oh, I'm looking to connect with this type of person. So other members start tagging people, which is awesome. But we have an incredible membership team and a wonderful onboarding process. So our members are onboarded very well. We have new member orientation for our members. And we do virtual learning events and networking events every single week in the community. And now our members are hosting meetups in different cities. We're doing big in-person events as well. So it's really just grown so organically over the past couple of years since we've launched the community. I'm a keynote speaker and I'm from the events space in the sense that I used to go to so many different conferences and in 2020, everything was online. So everyone had to start to get used to that. But then now it's a roaring comeback in terms of conferences and events. Yeah, people love the meeting in person. Yeah, we've done a few bigger events over the past couple of years, and we have an incredible event coming up this May. It's going to be May 3rd through 5th in Orlando at the Ritz Carlton. It's our Entrepreneurista Founders Weekend Wealth and Wellness Retreat. So we're bringing founders together for a whole weekend of connecting, collaborating. Top speakers are going to be there and entrepreneurs and really focusing on that collaboration and having people have the opportunity to meet the right people there to build these real meaningful relationships with a whole focus on building wealth in our business and our personal lives and taking care of ourselves. So how do you foster and maintain these good relationships with your business partners, vendors, or customers? 
So with my business partner, Courtney, we met in 2010. So we've been together for a long time in business. And really, it's all about with any partnership and any collaboration, it's all about communication and being able to have open and honest conversations, being able to set very clear expectations. And a lot of this was something that Courtney and I just both learned along the way from growing our businesses. A lot of what we like to share in our community is all of our learning lessons, things, especially things that didn't go well. Entrepreneurship is amazing. It's not always as glamorous as it might look on Instagram and everyone's marketing content. But if we can all share our learning lessons, we can save everyone a little bit of time a little bit of heartache and make things just a bit easier. (laughs) Any examples of when, and maybe in the early days where you didn't see eye to eye in something or there was some sort of conflict that where you just have two different points of view? I think the biggest thing for us was starting to work with a business coach pretty early on when we first started our business. It was about three years in that we were connected to our incredible business coach, Leslie. And it wasn't that we weren't seeing eye to eye. We didn't know what we didn't know because we had only been in business for a couple of years and we hadn't learned all of the things that we know now 11 years later. So really working with a business coach and setting clear expectations for our roles and responsibilities and really going back to that communication, right? Communication is key. And whether it's with a business partner or a vendor or team members, you're going to have to have fierce conversations in business. But being able to communicate and have those conversations is really, really important in business. Who does what role? How do you divvy it up? And has it changed throughout the years? So it's changed in the sense that now we have multiple businesses. So we really divide and conquer across multiple businesses. I actually run Entrepreneista and Courtney runs her agency business, Socialfly. And because we had scaled Socialfly and had a full management team, I was able to essentially step away from that business. We now have someone running marketing and business development that I didn't have to do that role anymore. So I was able to then move over and focus on building out our business with Entrepreneista. We have completely opposite skills skill sets, which is something that I definitely recommend if you're going to have a business partnership, try to partner with someone that has opposite skill sets than you do. So you can really divide and conquer. And that's worked really well for us. Sounds like you're really strong in this building phase, the zero to one, getting things off the ground. Yes. And then if you can share more about how Market came to be. So Market came to be, my husband and I are out to eat with my then seven-month-old daughter, I mean, we were talking about all of these items that we had in our apartment that she had outgrown. And I was telling him all of these things I needed to buy for her in the next phase. So I'm looking at Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist, and I'm like, this is not how parents need to shop for things. This makes no sense. So I text my business partner. I was like, I have the best business idea. Like, how is there not a Poshmark for parents? She's like, it's so funny you say that. My former boss, Anker, he actually just reached out to me because he's building this exact platform right now, and he's looking for marketing help. So long story short, Anker meets with myself and Courtney. And after spending a lot of time together, we realized it would actually make sense to formally partner together with our opposite skill sets. Because again, partner with someone who does not have the same strengths as you. So started building everything out for Market. We've done everything remotely. We built out this incredible app for parents to be able to buy and sell new and gently used items and have some big plans on the horizon for this year with everything that we're building, which is super exciting. I feel like I have so many friends who are moms. Right now, what we have done is just assembled new moms in a group. And everyone sort of posts things in that group saying, we don't need this chair anymore. Does someone want it? But I should totally tell them about market. What type of market research did you do before actually launching that? Or did you do some sort of market testing phase beforehand? So Anker had already done all this testing and he had all of this data and research to basically prove that we knew that there was a market for this. And I'm like, I know how to market this and bring the moms and bring the community together and help to build the brand. Yeah, you would know a lot of moms from the community. Speaking of community, what does community in business mean to you and why? Community in business is truly absolutely everything. I always say founders should not let founders go at business alone. We can all do so much more together when we have that connection and support and those shared resources. I see this all the time, even in our community platform, many people who have a similar type of business or service, and there's more room to collaborate than to compete. So community when building a business, I would say is the most important thing to be a part of 
and to join if you're serious about wanting to grow your business. When I was at Alibaba, we had this term called co-ompetition, which is cooperating, but you're also competing at the same time. And it just makes sense to bring that group of people together. They probably have the same problems, the same vendors are thinking about the different strategies and how to tackle customer segments and whatnot. So it's great to see that there's a more formal version of that in the founder space. So you told my team that 2024 is going to be the year of the community and partnerships. I'd love to hear your plans for the year for community engagement and enrichment. Absolutely. Well, we're so focused right now on expanding our community and reaching as many women entrepreneurs as possible so they know that entrepreneurs exist and that they can have access to our platform to be able to connect. We've really been investing in building out our community management team and all of the resources in our community so we can offer the best of the best to all of our members because we want to make it just a little bit easier than it was for Courtney and I when we first started Soul Supply. Do you see a pattern ever with people who are launching their businesses for the first time? What are some of the common problems that they all face, whether it's from a resource perspective or absence of knowledge perspective? So the biggest things that I see in terms of the founders that are just starting out, access to capital is something that we see all of the time. How can we get more money in the hands of these women who are first starting their businesses so they can have more of these resources that they need to start scaling their business? Something else that we see is needing help with marketing strategies. And ultimately, the only way to scale a business is to get more clients or to get more customers. And you need to be able to market your business. So a lot of our founders do have questions about how do I get my business out there? How do I position myself as a thought leader? We have lots of virtual events where we teach our founders how to get press. So how do they get out in the media? How do they build their personal brand? And then we offer all of the members of our community a feature on our website on entreprenista.com. So all of our founders get a beautiful profile piece on the website. And for some of them, that's their first piece of press and getting their business out there. Something I always share is getting those backlinks, going back to your website on credible media platforms is something that can really help with SEO. So we share that all the time with our members. So it's really helpful for them. A lot of times, like I said, it's their first press piece to be able to get that placement on Entreprenista as well. Does that come for free within the community or is that an extra package that we have to buy or founders have to buy? There is a membership fee to be part of the Entreprenista community. But once you join and you're a member, you get that guaranteed placement. That's part of it. That's super convenient. And then speaking of capital, we were talking about earlier. Is that why you started Pearl Influential? Yes. So that came to be, again, like going back to the beginning of this conversation, everything kind of evolved and all the businesses that Courtney and I have either started or been involved with over the years have just organically happened through our businesses. So we had met Alyssa Arnold, who is our co-founder of Pearl and really leads that business several years ago through Entreprenista. And Courtney and I and Alyssa, we were having these conversations about at Socialfly, one of the services that we offered Socialfly is influence marketing. So for many, many years, we've been contracting and working with these influencers. They're getting paid to post about different products or services. They might get paid in free product, but ultimately they're getting paid and they're helping these brands really grow and explode, but they might not have equity in the business. And then with so many female founders, we were seeing all of these women struggling to raise capital. And we were like, wait a second, what if we brought a community of influencers together with founders that were looking to raise capital and the influencers could actually invest in these brands that they were helping to build? and now they're investors on their cap table and they want to post and they want to share. Now the founder has to spend less money on marketing and these influencers actually have like a stickier reason to want to be sharing because they're essentially owners in the business. So we wanted to put that out there to the world and test that thesis and see if that could work. So we did that about, I think it was about a year and a half ago, or maybe it's been almost two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago when we first launched our first SPV. So essentially, Pearl, it's really an SPV vehicle for investors to have the opportunity to invest in some of these women-founded brands. And what we saw was that you don't have to be an influencer on Instagram or YouTube with millions of followers to be an influencer. We're actually all influencers, right? We're talking about different products and services. So really, it's how do we activate 
a base of investors who might not have had access or opportunity to have previously invested because they might not have known they were even an accredited investor or had the opportunity. And how do we bring all of these people together and still invest in these brands and businesses that they would be able to help build? So that's what Pearl is. And we've done, I think, about seven or eight deals so far over the past year and a half. And it's been super exciting. I love that model. It's basically, I think you are in the middle and you found the right balance between supply and demand, which is the influencer side and the founder side and matching them in a way that is not just merely a platform, but there's a stake for both sides of the party to cooperate, work together. And I imagine it's pretty heavily female-based as well. I've been toying with this thought or idea also on the B2B side. So there's a lot of influencers right now in relation to some sort of hardware product or physical product. Do you see the same thread possibly happening in the software side or service side in terms of a B2B realm as well? Do you mean in terms of investing or just influencers in general with B2B? Influencers in general with B2B because there's a lot of founders also in the B2B side. There's also maybe not as many influencers on the B2B side, like what you were saying with everyone is sort of an influencer these days. So I've been reading a lot with Scott Galloway, Simon Sinek, sort of those type of B2B influencer. They definitely influence a lot of CEOs as well as a lot of executives in the different conferences that they go to. And I've been meeting more and more of them. And I've just been realizing that they're an influencer in and of itself. And they talk about certain companies, innovative new types of softwares or startups. I wonder if your model could also work within that stream as well. With Entreprenista, that's essentially what we're doing. So we recommend all of our favorite business tools and solutions to not just our community for the Entreprenista League, but through our media site as well, through our email newsletter. And then we work with a lot of brands like Alibaba and other big brands and softwares that many people are using in their business. And then we partner with a lot of the founders in our community that want to share about their experience using those different softwares. That way there is more awareness awareness. So we're actually doing a lot of these B2B campaigns through Entreprenista, and we're definitely seeing a lot more of it as well. I was just thinking, especially right now, what's being launched a ton are these new AI tools. I don't know if you've hopped onto that AI trend and started testing things out and started to infuse things into Entreprenista, maybe. Maybe there's a smaller pod for AI things. Our members are asking for more AI content to really learn how to use AI in their business. We've been playing around like with a lot of the content AI tools at Entreprenista. So one of the tools that we started using is called Claude AI. What I will say about all of these AI tools, especially the ones for written content, I call it a great first draft. You still need to go in and edit it and make tweaks. It's almost like a great brainstorm. It's like, oh, that's like a good piece of content. Let me just fix that and tweak that. So it actually sounds a drop more like me, but it is pretty neat how you can really train these tools to speak in your voice and your brand. But I still have yet to see a post from that. You could just like copy and paste. Everything needs editing. So you are sort of using that in the ideation stage. So I guess from a female entrepreneurial lens, I think the experience of starting off a business is probably quite different. And that's why Entrepreneurista is there to help women founders as well. What do you think is the big difference between a woman founder starting out versus someone else? And what should they stop doing to thrive in the business landscape? I would say stop trying to do everything on your own. I know I've shared this before, of course, just about the importance of community, but you don't have to figure everything out yourself. There's so many resources that are available now and so many people who have done what you are trying to do that are willing to help. And I think that was something that was so eye-opening when Courtney and I started our first business. One of the first things we did was we joined an in-person group and community in New York City. So we initially had this group to go to, to ask questions, to get feedback from. And I can't imagine us not having had that initial group that we had years ago when we were first starting out. It just made things so much easier. Because Socialfly is so deeply embedded in the social media space, do you have any tips for founders or entrepreneurs starting out in terms of social media and how they can leverage their social media channels to grow their business? 
Yes, absolutely. So this is my favorite tip I love sharing. So many people really focus on building their audience and community, especially on Instagram right now. And you're creating all of this content, you're getting all of these new followers, and then you may be asking, but where are the sales? Why haven't I got new clients? Or why haven't I got new customers? This video went viral, or this post has a thousand likes, but nothing has happened. I think what everyone needs to remember is that social media was created to be social. And when you are posting content, even whether it's on your personal page or on your business page, there are people that are following you and liking your comments, start actual conversations with them. So on Instagram, you can DM people. And that's one of the best features of Instagram. There's so many incredible things that are happening in the DMs on Instagram and so much business that can be made. So if you get a new follower, DM that new follower, welcome them to your community and to your page, learn about them, start a conversation with them because ultimately we're all consumers. And as people, we all like to do business with people that we know, that we love, and that we trust. And if a brand is going to start a conversation with us, even if it's the community manager of that brand, but you start feeling connected to that brand or that business, you're more likely to want to buy a service or buy a product from that brand. So actually be social and have conversations with your audience and with your followers. And that's an awesome tip because we also follow so many different things on Instagram ourselves and we don't necessarily converse directly with that brand. Neither, I think, are those brands reaching out to me, I guess, directly that we forget that that's actually something that you can do. So to start off a conversation, to start talking. Yes. And you can learn so much from your customers as well. It's a great place to get feedback, to be able to learn. So there's a lot of things that you can do to grow your business and to learn from your customers in the DMs right on Instagram. Any other tips in terms of social media on video creation since videos and the video space is so big right now? Yes, if you have the opportunity to be able to get on video, potentially, whether either you're the face of the brand or you're posting content from your customers, there are a lot of tools to be able to make quick, snappy videos. So I would definitely do a lot of testing with video because they can perform very well on social, especially on on platforms like Instagram with Reels, and really just follow and see like what the trends are on different platforms. So it's really trying to stay up to date with the algorithms and what's happening with these platforms and testing things out. And you test and you learn and don't be afraid to try new content and see what works. And just remember, things are always changing. So what might work today might not work tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah, I heard recently on another podcast that this year was going to be the year of advertising on smaller social media channels, more niche ones, such as Pinterest, actually. I personally haven't tried to grow a particular thing on Pinterest, and I don't really know what that environment is like. Have you tried to kick something off in the Pinterest world? And how is that different from the Instagram space? Because both of them are actually very visual. Yes, it's a totally different platform and there's different strategies that are going to work on different platforms. So your strategy and what works on Instagram is probably not going to be what actually works on Pinterest. So my advice, and we have a lot of our members who are on Pinterest and are really growing big audiences on Pinterest, driving a lot of traffic and interest to their websites. I would do some friendly competitor analysis and see what other brands in your space are doing on Pinterest. See what types of things are getting repinned and what engagement is like. And then also you can ask your current audience and current customers like, hey, is everyone on Pinterest or using Pinterest? How are you using it? This is also a great conversation that you could be having in your DMs with your Instagram followers, asking them what other platforms they're on and just learning from them. Because one brand is on, it doesn't mean you have to be on it and it's right for your business. Every single platform isn't right for every single type of brand or business. When you are conversing with your followers on Instagram, is that always on a one-to-one basis or is it more in a smaller group where you're opening a group chat? So I recommend, especially in the early days of a business, if you can, doing a lot of these one-to-one conversations because that's how you can really go deep with your audience and learn about them and have them feel connected to you. They're going to be your brand ambassadors and your brand evangelists. So you really want to build these awesome relationships with your early customers. Instagram has another tool now that's called broadcast channels on Instagram, which I see a lot of brands using those. I've seen those work well for some brands. I made a personal one 
for my Stephanie Curtin channel on Instagram just to test it out because I'm always testing everything. And look, I think it can do well with the right strategy. But again, it's all about consistency. And if you're going to go in on something, you've got to be consistent and you've got to give it time to actually see if it works. I feel like those channels probably have to have the right balance between writing or posting, releasing something that's a bit too adsy versus true content and the people in the group. And then that's when I feel like when we're in so many of those, that's when it becomes too much. In China, there's WeChat. WeChat is sort of the messenger-esque, WhatsApp-esque type of app. It's also a super app. And a lot of brands and businesses would be doing this exact type of community selling and creating these groups and speak the VIP group that you talked about in WeChat. But WeChat is also where you converse one-on-one with your friends, with your colleagues, with business partners and whatnot. So it's a big mix of different conversations going on. I will say Facebook groups have been a really great way for brands to be able to like get their ambassadors or VIP customers together. And now there's community platforms, like the community platform we use for the Entrepreneurs League, we use a software, it's called Circle. It's an incredible, incredible platform. So we were actually on a different community platform when we first started the Entrepreneurs League. And about six months in, we actually switched over to Circle. And it's just this amazing community platform and tool I recommend it. And even brands that are trying to start their own communities or VIP communities of their customers, I recommend platforms like Circle because Facebook is great. I'm a customer of a pajama brand. It's called Little Sleepies. And she has tens of thousands of people in this VIP Facebook group and they're doing product drops in there like, and it's super engaged. But on a platform like Facebook, one, you don't own your customer, right? So if Facebook changes the algorithm or things happen, like you can't reach your customers. If you are on a platform like Circle, you actually essentially own your customers, if you will, because you're creating your whole app within that platform and you're not dependent on an algorithm. It's your own community. So I've really been sharing with lots of founders who are trying to create their own community within their business to use tools like Circle, which we love. I've used Circle myself because I was part of a community. And prior to Facebook, I think that a lot of online communities would be on Slack and it would be different Slack channels. And I think the big difference there is in the circle world, you almost enter this new web application that in your mode changes. So say you were in the Slack world and it's very businessy or you talk to your colleagues there. It's all about work. And then when you're jumping into circle, it's more harmonious or community feeling. And I think the posts when it's about sharing insights, it also changes how you interact with that specific medium. And I think Circle has done a really great job of that, for sure. Yeah, they're amazing. What advice would you have for managing stress as an entrepreneur? Because when you're first starting out or even in the middle or whatever stage you are, stress is always biting at our heels. If you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of your business or anyone else. And running a business is so challenging and can be very exhausting emotionally. So for me, I make a priority to calendar absolutely everything I need to do to take care of myself and put it on my calendar so I can't move it and essentially make appointments with myself. So my theme for the new year for the past two years has been on wellness and self-care because running a business, you know, it just can be all consuming on your phone and podcast recordings and videos, and it can be braided information overload. So being able to step away and schedule these self-care times is just so important. Yeah. So the tip is to just block off parts of your calendar so it's inaccessible by the outer world. You have to. Otherwise, it won't get done. And it's like has to be like non-negotiable. You're not going to block over that time in your calendar. And if you know that during the workday, you can't take time away from nine to six o'clock, schedule for later, schedule it for the morning, schedule things on the weekend when you don't feel the pressure that you like have to be doing work during those times. And then for me, I try to schedule walks too and just get outside because... I moved down to Florida to enjoy this Florida sunshine. And if I'm sitting inside all day, uh, <laughs> got to get some vitamin D and move around a bit. Are there any success stories from clients of yours or people in the community that you're particularly proud of that you'd like to share? 
Oh my goodness. Well, in the community, there are just collaborations and things that are happening every single day that I personally just get so excited about. I share with the community. I literally cry multiple times a week, but like happy tears because I'm seeing our members are collaborating. They're doing product collaborations together. I've made so many intros for our members over the past couple of years that have just resulted in new business and partnerships. And one of the intros I actually made right when we had started the Entrepreneurista League was to a fellow podcast guest who is a VC and she ended up investing a million dollars in her series A. So every type of connection and collaboration you can think of has happened over the past couple of years, but really it's just hearing from our members every single day, just the results they're having and that they're just so thankful that a community like this exists. So they have a place to go to really be able to get the support that's needed because it can be lonely out there if you're trying to grow your business by yourself and you definitely do not have to do it alone. <laughs> I think that's definitely the one big message there is the power of community. So where would you see yourself in five years? Oh my goodness. Five years from now, I actually do not see much difference in what I am doing today, five years from now. Like I have now, after all of these years building businesses, this is just what I was meant to do and why I am here to be able to help women be able to have the resources and community to grow their business. So five years from now, I actually hope to still be doing exactly what I am doing right now and just continuing to grow our community and just help as many founders as possible. Or maybe adding one or two more businesses to your current roster. That's what I'm not doing. So I'm maxed out. Just want to help everyone else with their businesses and focus on our community. <laughs> well, I think with Pearl Influential, when it's that sort of a launch pad for so many different more businesses to come. Happy to advise and invest in other women-owned businesses. But I don't see myself starting any brand new businesses. <laughs> Just helping everyone else with theirs. What would you say are 2023's biggest legacies and why? So last year, we launched our Entreprenista 100 Awards so we can help more women founders be celebrated for all of their business success, the contributions that they're making. So that was creating this platform to be able to help more women founders. And we're about to announce our winners of the next year. So in February of this year, we'll be making that announcement for the next class. And we're just excited to continue to celebrate as many women founders founders as possible because what Courtney and I saw in the early days of growing Social Fly, we started applying to and winning lots of business awards and awards for our work. And we saw the impact and the difference that made in our business by winning awards. And we also noticed that there were not a lot of award programs out there that were specifically for women business owners. So we said we need to create it and give women the opportunity to have that ability to get their business celebrated and promoted to help them grow their business. So we created that last year. And it was a big undertaking and very successful. So excited to continue it. I think a lot of founders probably also don't know that there are certain awards you have to specifically apply for. Are there certain ones that you recommend or get those communities to join? Absolutely. Now, it depends on the type of business that you are in. For Social Fly, being a service-based business, we, of course, applied to the Inc. 5000 list as we really started growing the company and we're on the list for a few years in a row. We were applying to like the Shorty Awards and a lot of the marketing awards that help you as you're trying to land new clients by showing that you're an award-winning agency. But there's specific like CPG awards and product awards. So I definitely recommend do a search depending on the industry that you're in and see which award programs could ultimately help your business. Again, it depends on what your goals are and what you're looking to accomplish. So for our Entreprenista Awards, it's open for any women business owner to be able to apply to win an award. And we open for a few months each year. And like you said, you have to apply to win. Just like most things in life, you have to put your name in the ring to be able to get it. And yeah, and then you get a lot of media exposure and marketing for your business. And there's a lot of ways to be able to leverage winning an award for your own marketing as well, which we've seen people in our community have had tremendous success being able to do that over the past year from our first class of winners. I was just going to ask also, because applying to all these awards take time out of actually building the business, what did you see as the upside for getting the awards yeah. So for Social Fly, it helped us in terms of landing new clients because we could share we were an award-winning agency. 
It also helped with our team and team morale. From a marketing perspective, we were able to have on our website that we won specific awards. So it definitely helps with marketing and branding too. I see. Last question to close us off is what advice would you give to your teenage self? Either the girl that sold a lot of boxes of Girl Scout cookies or when you got older and you were going into the business world. So I would tell myself, or I wish I knew that it would all work out. As amazing as the past 11 years have sounded building businesses, my life and a lot of the experiences I went through from childhood on, it was definitely not all sunshine and roses and have been through so much health-wise and lots of things have happened personally over the years. And if I knew as a teenager that everything was going to eventually work out and be okay in those moments, I think that would have been very helpful. I think it's always a point where everything works out and then you look back and then that's when you can connect all those dots and probably take away lessons of resilience or just adaptability after you've gone through all. But when you're in it, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks so much for sharing all of your insights. Thank you, Sharon. B2B Breakthrough is brought to you by Alibaba.com. To find out how Alibaba.com is empowering its customers with the tools, services, and resources they need to grow their businesses, visit Alibaba.com. And then make sure to search for B2B Breakthrough Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. Make sure to follow us so you don't miss future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Alibaba.com, thanks for listening.